Good morning. I'm Jennifer Books. I'm going to introduce our speaker today. A um, couple of things that Deanna wanted me to buzz through before we get going. Um, so we've got our new ethics credits to every biennium, and they're due uh, June of this year. So stay on top of that. Um, there's an evaluation form for the course today. So go ahead and fill that out and uh, return it at the counter where you signed in today before you leave. And on to our speaker. We've got Jeffrey Coleman. He's a licensed structural engineer and practicing attorney. And his practice focuses on construction law, professional liability defense, concrete construction, general business law, including insurance and coverage. He's known nationally for his experience and knowledge in the area of concrete construction and is the author of Legal Issues in Concrete Construction. He is the only attorney ever to be named fellow of the American Concrete Institute. He currently serves on the board of directors for the American Concrete Institute and American Council of Civil Engineering Companies, Minnesota. And he's been an instructor for AI Minnesota classes in the past, and the most recent one is con the contract session of last year's MFBA series. So please help me welcome Jeffrey Coleman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, step one, can you hear me? Okay. Too loud? Too soft? About right? And I'm, and I'm uh, uh, because this is a webinar, I'm trapped behind my podium here, so I won't be wandering around like I sometimes like to do. Since you are all architects, I can let you in on one of my pet peeves. And interestingly enough, we have all this technology. I have my computer, my PowerPoint. We have more people watching this program today as a webinar than in person. And yet I'm still working behind a 1950s podium. Why is that? Somebody tell me. You, you need a podium where I can put my papers and my computer and everything else. But since you're all architects, I thought I could complain about that. I know Frank Lloyd Wright used to actually design good design. So it's a business opportunity for somebody to come up with a tech-savvy, modern uh, podium design that we can use. OK, the topic for today is ethics. You are here because your board of licensure has decided that you need 2.0 hours of ethics credits. And I'm here to give you those 2.0 hours. You've got some of my background. I came out of Iowa State, uh, William Mitchell Night School, uh, PE in Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. I'm a, I'm a licensed attorney in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota. Of, of relevance to this particular talk today, I was on the Minnesota Licensing Board from 2000 to 2004, the, the AELS GID whatever board. We have the longest acronym of any state because all of our disciplines, architecture, engineering, landscape architecture, uh, surveying, uh, geoscience, and interior design are all part of one board, which has its pros and its cons. There's 21 people on the board. Uh, which means if you're dealing with a structural engineering issue, there might be one or two civil structural engineers on the board. So it's uh, sometimes you're in the major minority even when you're dealing with one of your issues, even as an architect. That's the, that's the con. The pro is it's a fairly diverse board. It even has some public members. But they've decided you need two ethics credits. I was on the board from 2000 to 2004. I was a one term. You can do two terms. There's term limits. But I was a one term appointee because I was a Jesse Ventura appointee. So I didn't get reappointed when he didn't get reelected. All right. So the main thing I want to tell you today is relax. We're all going to get through this. This is all stuff that, as I will explain to you in a minute, you're supposed to know anyway. Uh, and it's just, it's good every once in a while. Uh, you should all have in front of you Chapter 1805, the Rules of Professional Conduct. Um, this is something you should keep handy, and you should probably look at it once a year. It's two pages. I think it's four pages total, printed two sides, uh, fairly short read, the stuff you ought to, ought to brush up on once a year. So we start with the mission of our licensing board and why we have statutes that require you to be licensed as an architect. It is because uh, of this statement, to protect the public's health, safety, welfare by providing reasonable assurance of competent and ethical practice in architecture, professional engineering, land surveying, landscape architecture, geoscience, and inter certified interior design. That's the AELSGID acronym. So this 
Duty to protect the health, safety, welfare of the public is something I like to emphasize. It is a dual role, a dual duty. So you as a practicing architect, on the one hand, you have a duty to your client under the contract, and hopefully you have a written contract that defines the scope of work and maybe even more importantly what's not in that scope of work, but you also have a duty to the public at large. Now, most of the time, those two proceed without any conflicts, but occasionally, for instance, if you're asked to do something that doesn't meet code requirements or affects a life safety issue, I mean, the most blatant example would be, well, just leave the sprinkler system out of that portion of the school building. That's, uh, that's, that's something you cannot do. That is a code violation. That's where your duty to the public will say, I have to tell the client, no matter what they want to do, they can't do that. So you have that dual role, that dual duty that sometimes come into play. So what are the governing laws? Well, we have Minnesota Statutes 214, which governs boards generally. We have Minnesota Statute 32602 through 32615. Those are the statutes that govern the, the licensed practice of architecture and engineering, land surveying, and so on. And then we have the rules, 1800, which really governs general board operations, but then the rules 1805, which are the official rules of professional conduct. And that's what we'll be spending some of our time on. Now, by way of overview, we're going to talk about the rules. We're going to talk about some disciplinary actions or how you can get in trouble and how to avoid it. Uh, we'll take some questions and answers. And then the second hour, we're going to spend on some case studies. And we'll open up some discussion, hopefully, uh, about uh, some of these issues. Warning, baiting deer is illegal. This corn pile is intended for squirrels, chipmunks, and other animals. Any deer found eating this corn will be shot. Not exactly an ethical practice. Uh, we have a lot of hunters in Minnesota, Wisconsin. I like to show this slide. Uh, not, not a good ethical practice, obviously. All right, rules of professional conduct. They're contained in 1805. Now, one of my favorite baseball players, and some of you I know are old enough to remember Yogi Berra played for the Yankees, I think he played in 10 World Series, fantastic catcher, but the news reporters loved him because he had all these Yogi Bearisms and statements that he'd make that wouldn't make any sense, like you can observe a lot by just watching. If you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. It's like deja vu all over again. Nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. And one of my favorites, I really didn't say everything I said. Why would I bring up Yogi Berra? Because if Yogi Berra were talking about rules 1805, he would say 1805 are those rules you don't need to know because you already know them. Why do I say that? Because one of the first rules we're going to look at is uh, 0100 Professional Conduct Subpart 3. Each licensee who holds a certificate of licensure issued by the board is charged with the knowledge of this rule. That means we can all go home. And we could all go home because you're all supposed to know these rules whether you know them or not, except your board has decided you need two hours of this stuff, so you're stuck here with me for two hours. We're going to make it as interesting as we can. But you know these rules whether you know them or not, per Yogi Berra and per your board. All right, imputed knowledge. East, license, East licensee is charged with knowledge of this rule. That's our starting point. Then we go into zero... 200 personal conduct. And there are some kind of general platitudes, general types of restrictions that show up here. First is subpart one uh, a licensee shall avoid any act which may diminish public confidence in the profession and shall at all times conduct himself or herself in all relations with clients and the public as, so as to maintain its reputation for professional integrity. Now, when I get into the dispute section, the last case I'm going to talk about is a case that disturbs me because it comes out of the last newsletter from the board from last fall, and it's a case where an engineer was negligent in their practice, but somehow that was deemed to be an ethical violation and there was a $5,000 fine. I don't find anything in the ethical rules that says if you screw up and you're negligent, it's also an ethical violation. And I don't know how they de I don't know how they got to an ethical violation, but I'll go over the case with you. It might be this particular statement, though, this ge broad general statement that says we're not going to do anything that will 
diminish the public confidence in our profession. That might be one way they, they rope that in. You cannot make false to state, statements and any non-disclosures. A licensee shall not submit a materially false statement or fail to disclose the material facts requested in connection with the application for certification of licensor in this state or any other state. You can't lie when you apply for a license. And you shouldn't lie when somebody else applies for a license and asks you for a uh, recommendation or a referral or, or anything else. And you can't lie when the board asks you for information about an investigation, which can happen. Then we'll talk a little bit about the investigative process. Now here's an interesting one. A licensee shall not further the application for certification or licensure of another person known by the licensee to be unqualified in respect to character, education, or other relevant factor. So if somebody wants a recommendation or referral from you, uh, you have to be honest. And if you think the person is unqualified, then you should decline. You don't necessarily have to say why, but you're not supposed to further the application of someone you think is unqualified. Then we get into some general prohibitions in what I call the general prohibition section. First of all, you cannot circumvent a rule of professional conduct through the actions of another. You can't ask somebody else to do something that you can't do. You can't tell somebody else to delete that sprinkler system in the west wing of the school building when you know you can't do it. You can't engage in illegal conduct involving moral turpitude. How many of you know the definition of moral turpitude? I had to look it up. So you look at Webster's and it says mean and poor in quality. And then I had to go further, so I went to the Oxford English Dictionary and it says baseness, vileness, morally evil, wicked, disgusting, degrading, mean, and very bad. <laughs> Don't do anything very bad. Okay. Now maybe that's where the board roped this guy who was negligent in his practice into an ethical violation. I'm not sure. You cannot engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Again, kind of a general type of restriction. You cannot engage in conduct that adversely reflects on the licensee's fitness to practice the profession. Or, and here's one of the big ones, and believe it or not, I'm still seeing this. Permit the licensee's name or seal to be affixed to plans, specifications, or other documents which were not prepared by or under the direct supervision of the licensee. This is what we call plan stamping. All of you should know that when you put your seal on a set of documents or specs or a report, that means the report was done by you or under your direct supervision. I don't want you to skip ahead, but at the end of these rules, uh, are actually definitions of responsible charge and direct supervision. We're one of the few states who actually defines those terms fairly, uh, 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 fairly well uh, and fairly succinctly. So you, you cannot permit, you cannot stamp a set of plans if you, if, unless they're done by you or under your direct supervision. Now we're going to talk about what happens if somebody comes in from another state and there is an exception we're going to talk about what happens if, uh, let's say, you come into a job midstream uh, or you come into a new employer and you take over a job or somebody fires their architect and you take over midstream. What do you have to do to be able to say that it's done by me or under my direct supervision? But what you be able to, need to be able to say to the board, uh, probably in a deposition or under oath, is these plans, I can say that these plans were done by me under my direct supervision. All right, then we get into conflicts of interest. First of all, with, except with, with uh, regard to employment, this is uh, 1805.0300 uh, subpart one. A licensee shall avoid accepting a commission where duty to the client or the public would conflict with the personal interest of the licensee or the interest of another client. Prior to accepting such employment, the licensee shall disclose, and I recommend written disclosure to a prospective client, such facts as may give rise to a conflict of interest. Let's say your wife owns stock, a significant block of stock, in the company that you're designing a headquarters for. Or uh, let's say you're involved somehow in an ownership uh, of a minority interest ownership in a, in a piece of property, 
that you're working on the design of the building for. You need to disclose those potential conflicts of interest. That's the safe harbor. You're going to hear the term safe harbor. That, in, in an ethical context, that means what do you do to make sure you don't have a problem? Well, lawyers, we deal with this all the time. The first thing I ask uh, a client who wants to hire me is, who are the parties involved on the other side? I need to know who's involved because I need to disclose I might represent one of those parties, in which case I have to decline. Or uh, I might have represented them four or five years ago in which I need to disclose it and make sure they're okay with that. And then I get a waiver of that particular potential conflict. And many times the appearance of the conflict can be more damaging maybe than the conflict itself, particularly from a client relationship standpoint. All right, I also see this one happening, compensation. And it, not typically with architects, I'll explain. A licensee shall not accept compensation for services relating or pertaining to the same project for more than one party, unless there is a unity of interest between and among the parties to the project and the licensee makes full disclosure obtains the express consent of all parties from whom compensation will be received. Where this comes up is the geotechnical engineer who does work for an owner and does the overall geotechnical report for the site. And then later gets hired, say, by the contractor to do the testing uh, on that particular site, particularly the soil testing. Now, that's okay as long as it's disclosed to everybody. And I know this is happening actually all the time. But technically, that's an engineer who's receiving compensation from more than one party on the same project. Uh, you could get asked, say, I don't know if this ever happens, maybe to help a contractor with details, maybe to help a manufacturer with, with window installation details or flashing details or something. If, if they're getting used on a project that you're involved with, you're receiving compensation then from two parties on the same project. That needs to be disclosed. That's a, a potential conflict of interest, and it's a specific compensation conflict of interest under these rules. Now, here's another one that's interesting, gifts. A licensee shall not directly or indirectly solicit or accept any compensation, gratuity, or item of value from contractors, their agents, or other persons dealing with the client or employer in connection with the work for which the licensee has been retained without the knowledge and approval of the client or the employer. Now, when, when I grew up in engineering, I started at Ellerbee in 1977. I worked for a year or two, then the Hartford Coliseum collapsed. And I ended up living out in Hartford, Connecticut, Connecticut for a year and a half, getting the project rebuilt. I was a construction administration, on-site structural engineer. I went fishing with the contractor all the time. I went deer hunting with the contractor. I went to lunches and dinners with the contractor. And so part of that was probably technically a violation. I frankly didn't know it at the time. I thought getting along with the guys on a construction site would be a good thing. And if that meant they took me fishing, that was fine. But it wasn't solicited and it wasn't something of value in exchange for making the right decision on the project. It never influenced my judgment. But in hindsight, it's 30 years ago now, so I think this it will actually on an ethical violation, the statute has not expired, but we'll set that aside for a minute. <laughs> but but um, I'll talk about that in a minute, too. Um, uh, the, the point is it's, it's easy for these things to happen. Uh, the, and if it, if it does happen, what you need to do is disclose it to the client because you don't want the client finding out later that, oh, geez, this contractor's been taking this guy hunting or fishing or, or buying lunches and dinners, and no wonder he's not this architect isn't supporting my position or isn't looking after my best interest. Um, so you have to be careful about that. So the interesting thing now, what is an item of value? In Wisconsin, I just gave this ethics program in Wisconsin under the Wisconsin rules. There's no guidance whatsoever in Wisconsin as to what an item of value is. In Minnesota, at least we have some guidance. We have a public official's handbook. You know, I'm not, you're not public officials, but with a public official, uh, the limitations on gifts to public official also is anything of value. And of value means uh, a plaque with a resale value of $5 or less, a trinket or memento costing $5 or less, 
uh, informational material with a resale value of $5 or less. And I think there's food or beverages of $5 or less. So a contractor can take you out to lunch as long as it's a $4.95 Happy Meal. Or you can buy someone else, you can even buy a public official a drink as long as it's a $4.95 uh, beer or whatever, wherever it is. So that's, I think that's, again, the safe harbor if it's something less than $5. All right. Then we get into improper solicitation of employment. First of all, you are supposed to only seek and engage in professional worker employment the professional is competent and qualified to perform by reason of education, training, or experience. And, and I've always liked the way Minnesota has approached this. In some states, if you're an electrical engineer, you're actually, uh, uh, have your stamp says electrical engineer or mechanical engineer. And we know some states license structural engineers, SE, and, and we understand that because there's seismic considerations that are of more heightened concern in California and even southern Illinois and other seismic zones than here. Uh, but I like it. Here you're just a PE, and I don't mean just a PE, or an architect, and you're not licensed in any of the subdisciplines. I've always liked that. I like that approach because I'm, I'm just, in general, I'm in favor of government regulating our conduct less than more. Uh, but then the, the requirement on you is that you can only practice in areas that you're qualified to perform by reason of education, training, or experience. So, uh, if you've been working in a certain area for 10 or 15 years, you're, you can qualify by training or by education through your degrees or by experience. Uh, and that, uh, you know, my, my example is, uh, if you're a PE in Minnesota and I've got a degree in civil engineering and structural engineering, I could practice in electrical engineering, but I would have to do a lot of work and a lot of education, a lot of training, a lot of experience to feel that I was competent in doing that. In other words, if I put my stamp on a set of electrical drawings in Minnesota, I've created, I've, I've done an ethical violation. I've committed an ethical violation. All right, next statement. A licensee shall not falsify or misrepresent the extent of the licensee's education, training, experience, or qualification to any person or the public, nor misrepresent the extent uh, of the licensee's responsibility in connection with any prior employment. Now, I know this is a big deal for the architects. The engineers, it's important to them too, but I know among the architects this is a big deal, uh, particularly with the AIA and even the ethical issues. You, let's say you switch employers and you're making a presentation for a job and you put up buildings, pictures of three or four buildings and say, these were my buildings, I did these buildings. You got to be careful. If you were the architect who certified the plans and specs, you can say, I was the architect of record for these buildings. But if you just participated on the team that was involved with the design, you can say, I was the design architect that was part of the team that did these buildings. I was the architect who did the specs on these buildings. I was the architect who did these details on these buildings. I think you need to be careful and specific so you don't misrepresent what you did. I, I know that there are um, uh, complaints made and, uh, more frequently than you might think by architects against other architects about misrepresenting their portfolio of projects, particularly in the context of marketing. So it's something you want to be careful of. The other thing you can't do is misrepresent your education. You can't, you can't say I'm a licensed architect when I'm not. That's, in fact, that's holding yourself out as an architect, which is a separate violation. Uh, you can't say I have a master's degree in architecture when you don't. You can't say I graduated from Notre Dame when I didn't. I mean, all those types of things that are obvious, but uh, that's what we're pointing at. All right, the next one. A licensee shall not transmit, distribute, or publish, or allow to be transmitted, distributed, or published any false or misleading information regarding the licensee's own qualifications, training, or experience, or that of his employer, employees, associates, or joint ventures. Similar prohibition on misrepresenting your background experience and training. A licensee shall not tender any gift or offer to pay directly or indirectly anything of substantial value, whether in the form of a commission or otherwise, as an inducement to secure employment. Now, I had a very specific and a very interesting complaint 
and I represent architects and engineers in front of the board on complaints. Uh, I don't want to say frequently, but occasionally, okay? Maybe two, three a year, four years. And there aren't that many. But here's an architect who came to me about six or seven years ago, said I've had an ethical complaint filed against me. Every time I do that, by the way, I think of Marco Rubio. Every time I grab my water. Anyway, um, I've had an ethical complaint filed against me, uh, and they, they said that I gave tickets to the World Series to school board members in 1991. I can't remember if it was 87 or 91. It's one of the World Series with the twins. I gave, I gave World Series tickets to the school board members, a couple of the key ones, um, when I was competing for a school project. And w did, you, did you give the ticket? Yes, I did. And did you take them to the game? Yes, I did. And did you buy them anything of value? Well, yeah, I did. I bought some beers and hot dogs and stuff. Okay, so we looked at this, and uh, first of all, I was able to determine, well, th th and this has happened 20 years ago at the time, 15, 20 years ago. So the first thing I thought, well, there must be some statute of limitations as to ethical violations. Turns out there's not. There's no statute of limitations as to ethical values. So you can reach back as far as possible to make an ethical violation. Another reason to be very careful. The next thing we looked at is, well, this law about uh, uh, gifts to public officials wasn't passed until five or six years after that World Series. And then I think one of the things that helped us is they didn't actually get the job so whatever they did must not have been an inducement to get the employment, right? Uh, and we were able to get the, the violation dismissed. But it was, a, uh, it was an example of, of giving a, a gift to a public official. Now, these days, uh, public officials should tell you, like this happens with MnDOT all the time at a lot of the engineering conferences, um, they either have to, they have to pay their own way uh, and uh, if, if you ask a public official to go to lunch, they'll usually want to pay their own. Uh, they won't want they won't want to accept uh, anything of, of any value, and that's that. They've all been trained in that now, and they all decline it. And so anybody that's asking you for something, you should immediately uh, be a little bit concerned about what's going on. All right. Uh, 1805. False or malicious statements. Uh, make no false or malicious statements which may have the effect directly or indirectly or by implication of injuring the personal or professional reputation or business of other members of the profession. This is kind of the body embodiment of what we call uh, defamation. If you say something about a person uh, that is false and lowers their uh, stature in the community and damages them, that's defamation. If you say something about the business that hurts the business that's false, that's disparagement. Defamation, personal disparagement company. Uh, now, the defense to both defamation and disparagement is the truth. So if you say, you know, so-and-so stole money in 1976 uh, from the lunchbox, uh, and it's true, then it's not defamation, okay? But you got to be careful if you make any statement. If you, you make a statement that is going to injure somebody, you better make darn sure that it's true and you can prove it. And then you're bulletproof when it comes to defamation and disparagement and uh, this false or malicious statements comment. All right, knowledge of improper conduct by others. A licensee, meaning you, who has knowledge or reasonable grounds for believing that another member of the profession has violated any statute or rule regarding the practice of the profession, shall have the duty of presenting such information to the board. So you have a duty to report. Now, sometimes my clients come to me and say, well, this so-and-so so did this, and I think that's an ethical violation, and they should be reported. I say, well, do you realize that if you really believe that, you have a duty to report? And in fact, if you don't report, you're guilty of an ethical violation. So we, always, we want to be careful about how many, how many arrows we start slinging back and forth here. Yes, question. <laughs> Who is practicing architecture, I know they aren't licensed, but 
by this reading here, I would say they're not a member of my profession because they are architects. Do I have a duty to report somebody who is practicing architecture without a license? Yes, you do. Now, there's a, there, I know, I don't, wanna, I don't want this to erupt into a huge debate because I know there's, there's a fine distinction and maybe gray area between interior design and architecture. And I leave it to you guys to, so, okay, if somebody says, no, there's not, but, but I leave it to you guys to sort that out. I don't want to get into that debate today. But yes, if, if you are aware of somebody practicing without a license, you have a duty to report that. Yes? Um, but it wouldn't be an ethics. Well, it is. It could be. Yes, you have a duty. You have that duty to report, which is an ethical rule. Okay, another member of the profession. You're focusing on the profession. Um, well, that's, that's broad and a little bit vague as to what they're talking about as the profession. Um, yeah, I mean, you... Uh, the, yeah, I, 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 no, I, and none of, these, none of these are absolutely perfect. Minnesota's better than some. You read some of these ethical rules and they're all full of holes, but this, these are a little bit better. Now, it creates an interesting conundrum for me, because I'm licensed both as an engineer and a lawyer, so architect or, in, or uh, come, architect comes into my office, I did this thing, uh, do I have a duty to report it? I've always determined that my duty to represent them zealously within the bounds of the law as an attorney trumps that duty, and I've never been challenged on it, it's never been a problem. So that's, that won't work for you. Uh, you still have that duty. And then uh, when your question concerning any alleged violation on the part of another person, uh, you shall neither fail nor refuse to divulge such information as the licensee may have relative thereto. You have to be honest and forthcoming to the board. Wisconsin is interesting. They have a rule that says you have to respond to any questions from the board uh, in a timely manner, and if you haven't responded within 30 days, that's deemed not timely. So there's no, there's no deadline for reporting, but you have to report honestly. All right, here's an area where um, I've, I've covered uh, improper conduct by others. Action by another jurisdiction. Many people don't realize that a disciplinary action in another state can be deemed a disciplinary action or a, a violation in Minnesota if it would otherwise be a violation in Minnesota. And when you go through your electronic uh, renewals now, you'll come to a box that says, have you been disciplined in any other state? And if you say yes, you're going to get clicked out, and you'll have to go talk to the board and explain what the circumstances were. If you say no, you'll be able to proceed. However, if you say no, and it's later determined that that's not true, you're guilty of an ethical violation. And there's three or four of those we're going to talk about when we talk about the uh, disciplinary actions. All right, corporate practice. Um, I, again, I, I like the way that uh, Minnesota uh, operates. Here, we don't care if you're a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a corporation, a corporation with an S-corp election, an LLC, or a zebra. As long as you have an architect on your staff who's in responsible charge of the work, you can practice here as any kind of corporate entity you want. I like that approach. Now, many other states don't take that approach. Many other states have varying degrees of very, very specific, limiting, and frankly, parochial rules that require you to have a number of architects or engineers licensed in that state or all licensed in that state, uh, and, it, and it varies. So you have to be, when you get outside of Minnesota, You've got to go to that state, get their rules, and check the rules on corporate practice. Now, Mike, one of my partners down here, Mike Katz, he was general counsel for Ellerby Beckett. He was the last one. I was the first general counsel for Ellerby Beckett in the 80s. We, over our careers, have tried to design one corporate entity that could practice architecture in all 50 states. It's impossible to do unless you've got three architects that are licensed in all 50 states and you create a PC in New Jersey, I think it is. Something is, you get, that's kind of how to thread the needle. But if the minute you have architects that aren't licensed in all states, the minute you have non-licensed people as shareholders or board members, 
you're going to have to start jumping through hoops to practice in some of the other states. The good news is um, there, are, there are a few of them that are a real problem, like New Jersey, uh, I think New York, Washington, and, and Oregon used to be a couple of them. What are a couple of the others? Alaska. Um, so it, some of those states can be more difficult. Uh, all right. Uh, responsible charge. Here are our definitions. Uh, this is 1600 subpart 1. And the heart of this says that if you are in responsible charge, it means the person who determines design policy, including technical questions, advises the client, superintends subordinates during the course of the work, and in general, the person whose professional skill and judgment are embodied in the plans, designs, and advice involved in the work. Now there's an exception. Plans and specs for building structures or projects of a standard design which have been designed outside of Minnesota shall bear the certificate of the design or certification of the design professional licensed in another United States. Uh, in addition, the Minnesota licensed architect shall review the design and certify that it is appropriate to the site on which the construction is proposed and is in compliance with the Minnesota State Building Code. Uh, adopted by the Department of Administration. So the McDonald's store that's designed by the guys in Chicago, it's a standard store. They come into Minnesota. You take a look at it. You have your engineer look at it. Um, what, what, do you, what do you need to be aware of? Well, you need to make sure that the foundations will work for that site, that the roof will work for the snow loads or any snow shedding requirements, that it meets any code-specific uh, access requirements or anything else specific to Minnesota. And then I would be careful if you do this to attach something that says your review is limited to, you know, Minnesota building code relating to exiting or, or, or signage or, or foundations or roof or whatever it is. Be, be fairly specific about what it is you've done and not done. You don't want to suggest that you've gone through and done a complete reanalysis of the structure or a, or a complete Reanalysis or redesign of the design of the, of the project. Now, direct supervision has its own definition as well, uh, and it's, this refers back to 326.12. It uh, means the person who is the employer or employee of the same firm or who is under contract to or from another firm, which allows a, a, a contract employee to be involved whose professional skill and judgment are embodied in the plan, specs, reports, plots, or other documents required to be certified pursuant to subdivision, and directs the work of other licensees, interns, drafts person, technicians, or clerical persons assigned to the work, and is in responsible charge of the project, compromise the work being supervised. So it circles back to responsible charge. So you get a flavor for what you have to do if you uh, certify documents. All right, talk just a minute, and, and I'm violating one of the tenets of PowerPoint uh, uh, appropriate behavior, which is putting way too much language on the slide that you can't possibly all read. But this is the heart of something that I want to talk about for a minute. Each plan, drawing, spec, plat, report, or other document must bear the signature of the licensed or certified person preparing it, or the signature of the licensed or certified person under whose direct supervision it was prepared. There is the heart of what needs to be certified by you. The provisions of this paragraph shall not apply, and this came up because when I was on the board, somebody came in and said, well, what about plans and reports that are interim or for review? What about DD sets of documents? What about schematic sets of documents? And we said, well, we never intended for those to be certified, but they said, yeah, but it says any uh, or each. And, and we said, okay, we're going to clarify that. The provisions of this paragraph shall not apply to any plans, drawings, specs, plats, reports, or other documents of an inter-office or intercompany nature or that are considered to be drafts or of a preliminary schematic or design development nature by licensed or certified individuals who would normally be responsible for their preparation. So that's the exception for really final drawings, plats, reports need to be certified. Anything that's going to go into the building code official for a building permit needs to be certified. The required signature and certification must appear on all pages of plans, 
and drawings that must be signed, but only on the first page of the specifications, plats, reports, or other documents that must be signed. Two comments here. This is why you get the stamp on all sheets of the plans, but just on the cover sheet of the specifications. Every report I see from an engineer has the certification at the back with their signature on the last page. And yet, technically, this says, if you do a report, uh, it's supposed to be on the first page of the specifications, plats, reports, or other documents that must be signed. Just a minor technical detail, uh, but everybody puts it at the end. I, it's not going to kill anybody, but I, I, it's just interesting that I, I've noticed that. Now, a stamp printed signature or electronically created signature has the same force and effect as an actual signature if it creates an accurate depiction of the licensed or certified professional's actual signature. And, and we were one of the first states to identify electronic signatures and say, those are okay. We can use electronic signatures. But it has to create an actual depiction of the licensed or, profession, or certified professional's actual signature. So it has to be a facsimile signature. Now, in federal court, we have electronic signatures. And in other courts, we now have electronic signatures. I can be on an airplane flying at 35,000 feet, and I can file a document in federal court with my electronic signature. It's just a typewritten signature. It's a slash S Jeffrey W. Coleman thing, and anybody could reproduce it. I'm not quite sure why we can do that, uh, but that's the case. Here, you have to have an actual depiction of your signature. So we recognized this quite some time ago. Minnesota was kind of on the forefront of allowing electronic signatures. And can I review and certify the work of someone else? Okay. And uh, we talked about direct supervision. Um, and uh, the, in, in general, you can't. Now, if somebody comes to you with a project midway completed, they're, 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 they're transitioning, or you come into an employer, you pick up a set of drawings, you're going to be involved, you're going to have to certify those. You've got to go through that work to the point that you can say, with, with all, from, from all practical standpoint, I've reviewed this in detail enough and rechecked everything to the point that uh, it's done by me or under my direct supervision. That may cost extra for the client to you to get up to speed to that point, but that's what you've got to do if you're going to put your stamp on it. All right, now I'm going to uh, take, a, take a, a turn off the road just a little bit. Um, Performance specifications tend to be more common in engineering than I've seen in architecture. Uh, the, the classic is if you're, if you're working in, in residential housing, multifamily housing, condos or apartments, these days the mechanical and electrical will be done uh, design build by the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer, and you might have in your specs a set of outline performance specs that say here's the performance criteria we need to meet. Curtain wall systems, precast concrete systems, connection designs, and these are, like I say, more common with M&E. Can anybody think of an example of an area where you say provide, well, I suppose curtain wall systems. Curtain wall systems are often done design build on a performance spec. So you need a curtain wall system that, that can, is, is watertight and can maintain the wind loads under the code, right? So that's, that's an example. What, what I've always advised is that when you do that, make sure that those drawings are certified by an architect or an engineer other than you. So for instance, the precast manufacturer will have an engineer working for the precaster. You want that engineer's certification on those drawings. Why, why do we do that? It dates back to the Kansas City Hyatt walkway collapse. 126 people were killed. Uh, and the engineer argued that, well, I just designed, the, I, I, I did what I've always done. I sent the, this rod connection out to the um, fabricator to design. The fabricator designed it, so therefore the fabricator is responsible. The court said, no, you were the only licensed engineer in that chain of events. You could delegate that design work, but you can't delegate your responsibility for it. So since then, the AIA documents and other documents have, have said, you know, we'll see that. If, if you have somebody else doing the design work, uh, then you have to have it certified. Yes? Yes, I've never seen a stamp. Well, good, that's a, I, it's a good question. 
Never I, seen a stamp on a curtain wall is the comment. Yeah, the, the, the question is, I've never seen a stamp on a curtain wall. But if you have someone else designing the curtain wall for wind loads and others, I would require that it be certified by an architect or an engineer, just to be safe. All right, shop drawings. Now, here's my provocative point in the program, because I've got to fill two hours, so I've got to bring up some interesting stuff. Why do we get shop drawings? And, and, and I'm, we're, we're, this isn't the problem we're going to solve today. Uh, but the AIA and EJCDC contracts all say review is only for general conformance with the design concepts, does not relieve the contractor from his obligation to comply with the contract documents. And it says all over it that the architect's uh, only reviewing for general compliance. It's not a detailed review. It's not the quality control for the contractor. You're not responsible for that work or any deviations from the work because you've looked at the shop drawing, right? Okay. And, and it even requires the contractor review and approve them first, right? Which then somebody's laughing because we know either they don't do it or they put a stamp on it without looking at it. We all know that, okay? So uh, what happens then, and this has been happening in my practice for 30 years, is, is we get the case and we look at the plans and specs and everything's fine. And then there's something got changed on the shop drawings or something got missed on the shop drawings or something didn't get done on the shop drawings. And they say, well, you approved the shop drawings, therefore, Mr. Architect, Ms. Architect, you are responsible, along with everybody else. And you get sucked into the case, you can't get out on a motion for summary judgment and you're stuck there. So I ask the question. If if, if we just get sucked into these things because of shop drawings and all this language we have that's supposed to protect us never works, why do you even get them? Well, uh, I get varying uh, answers from people. Some say, well, it's an opportunity for me to finish my design. Hopefully that's not your answer. Uh, the owner expects me to review the shop drawings uh, to make sure generally everything's going okay. I, I understand that. Um, it's quality control for the contractor. That's not a good answer. That's, you're not the contractor's quality control system. So aside from the fact that I will never convince you to never get shop drawings or submittals, my rules are, or my recommendation is, only review what is a required submittal. You should list what's required. And I think submittals, there's a spec section on submittals. Is it 1,400 or is it? I can't remember. Is that right? Anyway. The spec section on submittals should list what you're supposed to get. Uh, and if it's not required, send it back. Say it's not a, not a required submittal. Uh, never review and approve safety programs. This is not a safety program seminar, but the rule is really simple. Don't have anything to do with site safety. Don't take responsibility for site safety by your actions. Stay away from site safety. Don't have anything to do with site safety. And don't have anything to do with site safety, OK? <laughs> With the sole exception of if you're on the site and there's an imminent danger of somebody being injured right now, you got to say something and do something. Tell the contractor, tell the owner, tell whoever it is if it's imminent danger of, of collapse, of danger. And this, this comes from a case called Carvalho in New Jersey and a couple others where the engineer is standing by the trench. They're digging a trench for utilities. They get to an intersection. They don't want to use the trench boxes, uh, so they leave it open because they'd have to cut the utilities going the other way on the road. Of course, the trench collapses, kills two workers. The engineer is deposed and says, were you there on that day? Yes, I was there on that day. I was standing there with my clipboard, observing the work and recording quantities and everything else. Did you see the condition? Yes, I did. Was it dangerous? Yes, it was. Would you go in the trench? Hell no, I wouldn't go in that trench. It was dangerous. Why didn't you do something? Well, because I'm not responsible for site safety, and the contractor is responsible for means, methods, techniques, sequences of procedures, and site safety programs in conjunction with the work. And he didn't actually say this in the depot, but he could have. He says, and my lawyer tells me, don't have anything to do with site safety. The court said, listen, if you're, if you're standing there and you, it's obviously dangerous and somebody could get hurt immediately, you need to do something. Now, they didn't give a lot of guidance in exactly what to do, but should have said something to the contractor, something to the owner, maybe even something to a building code official if necessary. But what, I do, what you don't want to do 
is be in that guy's position where I saw the whole thing, I knew it was dangerous, I knew somebody could get killed, and I did nothing. You want to say, I, I tried to do something. Okay. All right. Review for the critical elements. Uh, if you're going to review shop drawings, then look at what's critical. Look at the flashing details. Look at the uh, uh, connection if you're engineering. I, I go back to engineering because I know it better. Look at the connection details. Make sure load paths are going to follow down. Make sure everything's going to work. Uh, you know, and as I've said, once you've reviewed those shop drawings, you've, you've opened the door and you'll be open to a claim that you failed to catch an error in the shop drawings if one exists. It's just something you live with every day. All right, complaints. Uh, if you go on the uh, board's website, you'll find a copy of this little flyer on filing a complaint. Uh, everything you need to know to file a complaint with the board. Anybody in the world can file a complaint with the board. Uh, it, 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 it's an open process. Well, the process of allowing you to file a complaint is open. What happens after that is, uh, is remarkably closed. Um, the complaint goes into the board. It goes to a complaints committee. The complaints committee exists of, I think it's five people and, and the executive director. Uh, and interestingly enough, that complaints committee operates as a, as a isolated star chamber. Even as a board member, I could not find out what was going on at the complaints committee because it's a matter of privacy under the Minnesota Data Privacy Act. And even as a board member, there are provisions that say, well, if you have a need to know, you can learn what's going on at the complaints committee. I raised that once at a board meeting and it says, well, nobody's ever asked to do that and we could never do that. You can never find out what's going on at the complaints committee. They have investigators that look into the complaint, they solicit information, they take it back to the complaints committee, then the complaints committee makes a decision, then it comes to the full board in a closed meeting for approval by the board. Generally they are approved, but sometimes we would question complaints as, uh, and, and get, they'd get modified or revised. Uh, if those are approved, then they become official disciplinary actions uh, and they show up sometimes in the newsletters. If they are dismissed, that's usually the end of it. Uh, it doesn't come to the board. A letter, the, the party against whom the complaint was filed gets a letter saying the complaint uh, was dismissed. All right, disciplinary actions or how can I get in trouble? So you can learn a lot by looking at the disciplinary actions uh, that are published in the newsletters. And the last one that came out was this last fall, that's the last one I'll talk about, but, but just by way of uh, categories, the first way to get in trouble is have a lapsed license. Now this, this also happened to me because when we converted from the little card you used to get to remind you to renew your license to the electronic, uh, I got a call from Dave Oxley at Consulting Engineers Council, said, Coleman, aren't you a PE in Minnesota, aren't you? I said, yeah. Well, I don't find you on the list. And I said, oh, crap. Uh, I went back and I realized I, I hadn't gone on my computer and done the renewal. And by the way, if you don't renew your license, the fact that your secretary didn't do it for you, that's not an excuse, right? You're responsible for renewing your license. So I scrambled real quick. I went in and renewed my license. I paid a late fee of 15 bucks or something. And everything was fine. It was in that grace period of time. But so pay attention to your licenses. Now, in general, um, the board, when I was on the board, you know, fines of $500 to $1,000 were pretty standard. Uh, that has gone up significantly. And the lapse license area is an area where uh, they, they have a lot of them, a lot of complaints, and they investigate them and they, they bring actions. So you'll get, you'll get complaints or, or areas where here's a, here's a 14 month lapse where five projects were certified during that time. Uh, the respondent here was reprimanded and there was a fine of, of $3,000. Um, and there's a, there's a number of them. I'll give, you, I'll give you a range. Nine months, 13 projects certified, $4,000 fine. Eight months, 11 projects, $5,000 fine. Uh, five months, two projects, $1,500 fine. Six months, no project certified, a $500 fine. 
eight months, two projects certified, $2,500 fine. Now, the record goes to an individual I won't mention by name. Uh, licensed, uh, license expired in 1998 and didn't discover it until 2009. Now, I know it, it's, it's, it's humorous, but this person was a principal in an architectural firm. Uh, and was sitting down with, well, I'll just, I'll just go over this a minute with you. Respondent stated on 09, I was reviewing hours for an intern architect I am mentoring. I checked my Minnesota registration and discovered at that moment I did not have a current Minnesota license in my file. I, he self-reported himself to the board. He called Andrea Baker, Barker, who is one of the investigators, uh, and uh, sent in money to renew his license and did everything he could, but then he cooperated with the board's investigation. It turns out that over that 11-year period, he had certified 436 projects uh, as an architect with his stamp. And the board uh, did say that his actions were unintentional and inadvertent, and thank you very much for self-reporting, uh, but he was reprimanded and received a $25,000 fine. 25000 So that's that in, in, uh, that's the record that I'm aware of, as the fines go. All right, out-of-state engineers certifying work uh, in Minnesota, or it could say out-of-state uh, architect certifying work in Minnesota. This, this is a little bit of an interesting one. Um, this is a guy from Iowa who comes up to, uh, where was it, Goodhue County, working on a wind farm on a guy's farm. And they decide that they're doing this engineering work on the wind farm and that he would put his Iowa stamp on the drawings in Minnesota. Well then, at some point he must have realized, oops, this is a problem. So then he started to backpedal. But the first thing he tried to do is, is say that uh, uh, they, they were just trying to have some engineering certificate, and it was obvious it was Iowa, so he didn't misrepresent that he was licensed in Minnesota because the stamp said Iowa, and they just thought that, well, some engineering stamp would lead more credibility to the work. And then he tried to argue that, well, this is an agricultural exemption because it's on a farm, and, and that didn't work. Um, and, and somebody assured him that the Goodhue County Board would understand that his PE was not valid in Minnesota. Uh, and in any event, none of that worked with the board, and he ended with, my only defense, and I quote, I think, is that this was a rookie mistake. Well, he was reprimanded, reprimanded and a $2,000 fine. So uh, the, the best way to remember this is, if you're an architect in Minnesota, you're an architect in Minnesota. You're not an architect in Iowa, or North Dakota, or South Dakota, unless you're licensed there. Uh, now, it, it's even gotten to the point where some people are, are designating on, for instance, their, their electronic signature on their email uh, or their letterhead or their business card, you know, licensed in such and such a state. I've, I've put a footnote in at times where I'm licensed just so I'm not misrepresenting to somebody if I'm in Missouri that I'm a, a PE in Missouri. Because I've, I've handed out business cards at an AIA convention in Missouri that says PE. Well, technically, that's holding myself out as a professional engineer in that particular state that I'm handing out a business card. Fortunately, people don't tend to slice things quite that finely, but it's something to be aware of. It's a potential. All right, <clears throat> failure to disclose a disciplinary action in another state upon renewal. This is uh, another one that can get to be a problem, and I, I, I alluded to this earlier. So. If you go through this renewal process like this particular person did, you're asked this question. Since, and this one was since July 06, have you had a license disciplined, denied, surrendered, suspended, or revoked? There's a button to check yes or no to this question. Directly below this question, ask the licensee, I swear or affirm I have read the foreknowing application and continuing education reporting screens and that the statements are true and complete. Uh, the next step is to check the box. If I accept, uh, you must check this box to continue. Respondent check the box. Uh, if the respondent selected yes, uh, uh, 
you would not have, would not have let him continue. It would have to give him the error message and would have to go to the board, contact uh, the investigator at a number that you have to call. So this guy had a, a violation uh, in Colorado and, and didn't respond on the application, and somehow they found out about it. His response was, well, apparently I misread the question thinking it was asking if my license had been denied, suspended, surrendered, or revoked. Uh, and he didn't think that there was a question that he entered into a stipulated order. In other words, he, he, he settled with the board and entered into an order. Uh, and that should have been, uh, uh, should have been, uh, disclosed. So in this particular case, this guy was close enough to retirement that he said, you know what? I'll just surrender my license because I'm retiring anyway. So he basically threw the towel in and, and went away. Um, and there's a couple others. There's one here with an Oklahoma uh, violation, uh, entered into a consent order. It was not disclosed. And that was a, a reprimand and a $1,500 uh, penalty. Here's an Iowa violation, another one where he was reprimanded, $1,500 uh, fine. All right, another way you can get into trouble is failure to pay Minnesota tax or tax returns. There's always a number of these every year where somebody gets their license suspended until they've paid their Minnesota tax. Now, interestingly enough, the board doesn't care if you pay your federal tax. So, <laughs> so pay your Minnesota tax. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay your federal tax whenever you can. But if you're going to do one or the other, pay Minnesota first. All right, here's one that where we see a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of issues and it's worth discussing. Failure to maintain uh, professional development hours, records. Uh, the, the, the records you must maintain have to include some kind of paperwork showing your participation in a particular course or activity. Certificates, registration receipts, copies of presentation materials or notes. So hopefully you're going to get a certificate today that evidences your participation in this two-hour program. What happens is when you renew, you self-report. This is like income taxes. You self-report that you have so many PDH hours, and you say, I attended this two-hour presentation with this guy named Coleman. Nothing will likely ever happen, except that, because the board doesn't have the staff to check everything, they will do a uh, periodic uh, random audit. And I don't know how they do it. I don't know where they get the numbers. And they pull them out of a hat. I don't know but it's very random and it's a small percentage. They'll call you up and say, prove to me you had these hours in this reporting session this last time around, and then you come up with your file that has all the certificates in it for Minnesota. You go in and say, here are all my certificates. If, if you are unable to do that, you can, you can have a problem. And there are a number of those that have been reported over the years. And the one that's most specific, I want to touch on briefly. The, uh, the board is very specific in these violations. Uh, acceptable, then this is straight from the board in their decision. Acceptable supporting documentation must include some kind of paperwork showing your participation in a particular course or activity. Certificates, registration receipts, copies of presentations, notes, the agenda you submitted does not show the course conduct for each subject. The, and here's another one. A list of courses or activities that you participated in is not considered sufficient documentation. Acceptable supporting documentation must include some kind of paperwork showing your participation. Certificates, registration receipts, copies of presentations, or notes. So as long as you got a certificate, uh, you should be okay. Failure to pay child support, you can get your license uh, suspended. Uh, providing professional services when not licensed at all, which, which leads me to one of my uh, all-time favorite uh, violations. Here's a guy who was educated as an architect, but not actually licensed as an architect. Okay. And he uh, does a lot of residential work. So as a residential architect, you are exempt, right? But then he sends this letter out to the neighborhood that says, I am an architect working in your neighborhood on several different projects. Now, what did the person do wrong? He said, I'm an architect. That architect or architecture are protected terms. You can't use those terms 
unless you are licensed. The engineers didn't do as good a job protecting their, their identities because you can use engineer. You can be a sanitary engineer. You can be a software engineer. You can be an engineer driving a railroad train. That's not a protected term. Professional engineer is protected. Professional engineer. Do you have a question? Why is it that software um, profession and software industry can become consistent? There's a question on software industry. The question is why can the software profession consistently advertise that they are architects or software architecture? The, they, they can't. Report them to the board. And I know, I know they do. I know they do. And the board, the, the board actually tracks those things. And they used to go through the yellow pages. And anybody using the term architecture in the yellow pages, they used to file a complaint against. But I understand, and it's a protected term, and they shouldn't be using it. So this person says, I'm an architect in your neighborhood I'm, uh, on several different projects. I love being an architect and seeing my clients' dreams come into reality. My office handles architecture, land surveying, engineering needs for residential commercial projects signed by this person. Now, the only problem is one of the people in the neighborhood was Doreen Frost. You know who Doreen Frost is? She's the executive director of the licensing board, who when she sees the word architect or architecture, immediately goes to the list, and if they're not licensed, she files a complaint. So this guy got a complaint filed against him, uh, and he was, uh, had to enter into a cease and desist order to stop using the term architect. I'm going to wrap up with one. I'm probably going to skip by that for now. I'm going to wrap up with one that bothers me. Here is, just from this last board letter, here is an engineer who was hired to do plans and specs and use uh, lightweight tire chips as fill for some driveway projects and signed and sealed drawings for that project. Uh, there was a problem, and the bottom line is they argued that uh, the quantities exceeded the accepted engineering or commercial standards and failed to obtain a case-specific determination of beneficial use from the MPCA and should have advised the client to get this MPCA permit and didn't do it. It went up to the Court of Appeals. He was found to be negligent. That somehow became an ethical violation. And the person was reprimanded and fined $5,000. I'm bothered by that because if you screw up and make a mistake and you're negligent, that's what you have professional liability insurance for. That typically has not been an ethical violation. This one particularly bothers me because the owner here was this guy who I won't name. It's in the board letter. Uh, and he owned this property that the project was, but he also owned First State Tire Disposal, a waste tire processing facilities that sells shredded tires and tire chips for use in construction projects. This guy knew or should have known about the use of tire chips, which also bothers me. And I, I don't know the background of this one, but I'm concerned when we start seeing negligent actions become ethical violations. All right, I'm going to move on. We're gonna take a, yes. What qualifies the verification of your title? I believe that the state of Minnesota will accept AIA transcripts as verification as well. So yes. if you're audited and you don't have a certificate and you don't have all the other things that you listed, if you do have AIA, AI national transcripts, that would qualify. Thank, thank you very much. The point was, a, a good point, I'll repeat it for those of you in cyberspace listening to this. Uh, if you have an AIA transcript and this has been recorded in that AIA transcript, then that's acceptable supporting documentation, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, 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 why don't you explain that? If you're an AIA member, you have a transcript that's being kept for you on the National AIA's website. If you're not an AIA member, then you need to keep track of your own CE by way of the certificates or receipts or whatever. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. And, the, and there is a distinction. For the AIA credits, you have to have the 
the AIA learning objectives, it has to be submitted, it has to be approved, you have to jump through all these hoops for AIA credits. That doesn't apply to the board, our licensing board. You just have to have the professional development hours that qualify. But the AIA keeps that separate requirement, which is fine. All right, I'm going to talk really quickly, just for a minute. Um, this issue of a fiduciary relationship between you and your client was tested in Minnesota. Uh, in this case, Carlson v. Sala. Uh, is, is your client relationship a fiduciary relationship? Now, obviously, most of you think that the relationship with myself and my client is one of trusted advisor and all these good things, and, and I'm going to do what's in the best interest of my client. But you want to be careful about ever agreeing that that raises to the level of a fiduciary relationship. Because if you are a fiduciary, then your sole objective has to be doing only what's in the best interest of that client like somebody managing their money, like somebody who's an attorney, in fact, for an elderly person in a nursing home and handling their affairs. What happened here is that uh, there was a, a drawing title block that had these two architects. One was not licensed in Minnesota. And the other side, this was a residential project. And the nastiest lawsuits of all, by the way, tend to be residential projects because they're personal. Um, and the court ordered that this was a fiduciary relationship and therefore they were going to disgorge fees. So the architect had to pay back $300,000 in fees. Of course, they took this up on appeal and the court said in Minnesota, the relationship with a design professional is not a fiduciary relationship uh, unless the contract designates it as a fiduciary relationship. So just stay away from that issue of fiduciary. All right, let's take a five minute break. And then we're going to launch into some case studies. Uh, so, well, let's, yeah, the, yeah, let's take five minutes. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's reconvene, and and those of you in cyberspace, I can't tell if you're at your desks or not. That's a disadvantage to a webinar. However, what we're going to do now is launch into a uh, case study. You are approached by the university architect who tells you he will be on a Canadian fishing trip next week at Big Slave Lake. He tells you that if you want the next university project, it would be a good idea if you came up there and we discussed it. So what I want to know is, can you go? Can you pay for his trip? Can you buy him dinner? Can you buy him a drink? And what do you say if he tells you, I'll make sure you get the next job if you pay for my trip? Now, I'd like you to break up into groups of about three or four five max uh, as you go around the room. So you've got three here, four there, four in that row there. Kind of break up kind of by rows or turn around and I want you to discuss this. I want you to actually go through and write down the list of the answers and the reason why or why not. Any other comments you have? Any other questions you have? All right? And I'm going to give you about five or six minutes on this. And then I am going to come back and ask somebody to report.
I know why you're asking. So how does this, uh, that's just on off? Okay. So I'll, uh, we don't want to pass it around as best we can. All right, let's, uh, about one more minute, one more minute, and uh, wrap up. Okay, so we are doing this as a webinar, and I'm, I'm reminded that there are more people than are in this room out there in cyberspace listening to the program, so A, those of you who are on the webinar version of this program, you should also be going through this exercise, and if you're sitting in a conference room somewhere in your office, please uh, 
uh, go through the exercise and, and write down the, the, uh, the answers to the questions. B, uh, I'm going to have to hand a microphone around to somebody so everybody can hear what's being said. Uh, and I would like C, I would like a volunteer group to report on what they think they can do here with the fishing trip to uh, Big Slave Lake. Anybody? All right. Find, find me the group in the middle right over here. Jolson's group. <laughs> See, that's you get picked on. <laughs> Am I supposed to report back on this? Yes, yes. What did your group uh, say The consensus that? was yes, no, 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 and no. And that's a typical Jeff Jolson report. Uh, <laughs> definitive and succinct. All right. So uh, you, why can you go on the trip? Keep, keep the mic just for a minute. I just want to have a little discourse. You can sit down, but uh, why? why? It's, it's, still, it's still a free country, and I assume Canada is still a free country. Yeah, and you're not. She's from Canada. Yeah. She's nodding. And, and, and you're not tying the trip to um, any job, and you're not getting a job because of the trip, and you're not offering that. Now, there's a question here. Isn't there a stated quid pro quo here, though? Where so, so the... <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> the the question is, isn't there a, a implied quid pro quo? In, in other words, by doing this, now that gets into another issue. Well, no, it says, can, well, it says it would be a good idea if you came up and we discussed it. Okay, well, okay, yeah. I, I think the better response is you shouldn't go because either maybe it edges into, for your reasons, it edges into a, a quid pro quo, or it, it obviously doesn't look good. And it doesn't look good for this guy who's bringing people up to talk about projects. I mean, he's also got public meeting laws that he should be complying with and other issues he should be complying with. Although, I mean, everybody in this room, I'm guessing, has discussed projects with a public official at some point off the record or in casually or whatever, or what's coming up, what we, you know, we'd like to be able to present on that project, we'd like to show up. And it, 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 until it gets to the point that I'll buy you lunch if I can get the next project or you show up here and pay for something, then it gets to be more of a quid pro quo. But it's a good, good point. Um, and can you pay for his trip? That's an obvious no. That's something of value and it's certainly more than five dollars. Could you buy him dinner? <coughs> $4.95 French fries or burger? Can you buy him a drink? $4.95? Okay. And, and now, what if he says, I'll make sure you get the next job if you pay for my trip? Obviously, the answer is no, but this is the university architect. You have an obligation, a duty to report. Okay. This couldn't happen in Minnesota. Because? So the question board. it couldn't oh say it couldn't happen in Minnesota because of the designer selection board good right. point the architect has no choice in its selected. right but it could be a member of the designer selection board true. So. But he doesn't have to be an architect. well that's true it wouldn't have to be an architect <laughs> and I'm trying to re I'm trying to repeat pardon me Uh, does anybody know that? I can't remember. I think you might be right. I think you might be right. So it did what it wanted. And we're going back a period of time. Yeah. But as I remember, there was a jurisdictional limit. There was struggle to keep the university within it. And there was some argument that the University of Minnesota has made that because they were chartered Somehow they were chartered before the state was chartered or something. They've, they've argued they're not part of the state or something right. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Which, until they want money, yeah, I think it's, yeah. All right. Case study number two. Your big corporate client, Acme Company, has a new job for you in Michigan where they want you to go there to meet the local management team and present your proposal to design a regional headquarters building for Acme, Michigan. Can you go to Michigan and interview for the job? Why or why not? Take five minutes, discuss it, we'll get back together. And this time I'm going to call on somebody over here. I won't tell you who, but it'll be on this side can, of the room. Can I just ask one more question about the previous oh, one case more question. study? 
yes. Where's if that question? were a private corporation, could I say yes to every one of those questions? Where, where's the question coming from? Oh, there. There you go. So in the previous um, case study, can I say yes to any of those things if it's a uh, private corporation? With no, a, because you still have the prohibition of giving something of value to get a job. That's not public. I use the public official $5 limit as an example of something of value. But those prohibitions in rules 1805, that's not public. That applies to any job. So, but, so all the same answers would apply in yes, this case. Yes. Okay. All right. Number two. Five minutes. We'll reconvene and discuss. Thank you. 
Okay, let's uh, let's reconvene. Uh, I'm going to hand the microphone over to somebody. I'll let you pick a row. Just pick a row. Pick pick a row. Pick somebody. Pick a row. Okay. All right. So here's here's what we want to discuss. You've got this big client you work for in Minnesota. They say, I've got this big plant in Michigan. You're my architect. You're my guy. I want you to do this job for me in Michigan. But you've got to go there and meet with the local people and make a presentation and talk to them because I want their blessing. I want them to buy in on this. Can you go? I don't see why we can't go. Okay. And I'm not an architect. I'm a civil engineer, structural okay. But we are licensed there, and I have my partner who, who is an architect uh, licensed in Michigan. Okay. So I don't and, see why we cannot and you, go. And you are licensed in Michigan? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, and, and this could say engineer. Doesn't, it could say design professional. It could be architect or engineer. Right. So, so here's the deal. Once, once you walk into Michigan, remember, unless you're licensed in Michigan, you're no longer an architect. You're just a cit You're an ordinary citizen. And you start handing out cards that say architect and make a presentation or uh, hold yourself out, you're practicing architecture in Michigan. Now, another variation of the answer from other groups I've gotten is, well, I've got Joe who's an architect, so I'm going to take him and then I'll be okay. And then my follow-up question is, okay, but can, that means you can go to Michigan. Can the company, can your company go to Michigan? Do you know? Okay. Depends on what Michigan says is the very, very good answer. That's when, uh, you know, when your lawyer talks to you and says, let me get back to you, that means you want to go do some research. Uh, and that's what you should do is do some research. How many people know what Michigan requires for the corporation to go there? Yes. We are registered in Michigan, and two-thirds of our partnership need to be registered in Michigan, and we need a business license and an address in Michigan. Two-thirds of the principals of the firm have to be licensed in Michigan. Two-thirds, principals. And principals, I believe, is still defined as officers and directors. That's where you start getting into these issues of, uh, you know, unlicensed principals or uh, people not licensed in that state can be an issue. Now, uh, the other thing you need to do to go to any other state to practice, you have two hoops you have to jump through. Hoop number one is you just need to be licensed, uh, not licensed, you need to be registered with the Secretary of State in that state as a foreign business corporation. You have to do that whether you're selling architectural services or pencils and pens and rubber bands. Okay, that's just, if you're doing business in a state, you have to license, you have to register with the Secretary of State. You just say, here's my, here's my business uh, location. Here's the person that can accept service of process for me uh, in Michigan, and the, I'm a business in Michigan. That also opens up the possibility that they track income taxes and all kinds of things, but there's nothing you can do about that. Then you need to go to the licensing statutes and the rules in that state and check and see what the state requirements are. Some have them, some don't. Iowa has a couple of hoops to jump through. Uh, Wisconsin, all you have to need to do in Wisconsin is say, I'm, I'm registering myself as a corporation in Wisconsin, and then you designate the person that's in responsible charge of the work. No requirement that a percentage be licensed. You can have one architect license in Wisconsin, go to Wisconsin, file with the board, I'm XYZ Corporation, here's my registered architect in Wisconsin, he's designated as in responsible charge of the work then you're okay in Wisconsin. Every state's different. Some states don't have any requirements like Minnesota. Some states have more. Any questions on that? There are a couple of questions, yes. Oh, God, I got a question from my own guy. <laughs> Wait a minute. Supposing the management team comes to you 
and says, we would like you to do the design, but we've got a local who will be a, who will be the architect of record. Then I, then I think you're okay, because if you've got the local Michigan architect who's the architect of record in Michigan, mm -hmm. then you're okay. But as I, long as they can say they're in responsible charge of the work. I, I think that's what the, the fundamental structure from the statute is you can't promote here if you're not licensed here. Right. But you can sit home and promote work or accept work here. Well, you can't, but you can't hold yourself out as qualified to practice and in Michigan unless out. you're licensed well, in Michigan. Yeah, so. so it's the holding out that's the issue here. This is a Socratic discharge between or the intercourse between lawyers here. All right, go ahead. Suppose I work for these people. I'm a new hire. They have got all the certification in Michigan. I get the call to go and represent the firm in Michigan, but I am not registered in Michigan. Is that all right? Can I go and uh, represent the you're, firm? You're, 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 you're zeroing in on, on, on a fine line. If, if you did that, I would recommend that you show up and say, I'm not licensed in Michigan, but I have this guy with my firm who is, and he'll be in responsible charge of the work, and here's what we want to tell you. I mean, as, as the sort of person who can go and schmooze the people yeah. and, and sell the job. Yeah. I, you know, I, think that, I think that's okay. I, 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 would be, I think it would be difficult for somebody to make a complaint if you go in and say, look, I'm not licensed in Michigan. We got these guys licensed in Michigan. They'll be doing the work, but here's what I'm here to tell you. Basically, I'm the marketing guy. I'm the sales guy, right? There was another hand up. Yes. Just a minute. Wait, wait just a minute for the mic to get back there. There you go. So just explain the, the difference between a design architect and an architect of record, especially when it comes to a situation like this. Well, there are a couple different levels. The architect of record is generally the person who stamps and certifies the documents. You're, you, that's the official architect of record as to the building code official, the building permit, the certificate of substantial completion, and so on. Um, but then there's a broader prohibition. You cannot represent that you're an architect of any kind unless you're licensed as an architect in Michigan. Okay? Does that clarify that? That's what I was trying to find out. Okay. Yes. You have to be, they both have to be licensed in that state, the design architect and the architect. Yeah, it, regardless. If, you, if you're holding yourself out as an architect, you have to be licensed as an architect in the state in which you're holding yourself out as an architect. Okay? All right, we need to keep moving. I'm always committed to getting you guys done on time. Case study number three. A new client calls you, they're firing their architect and want you to take over the project. Uh, list what you will want to know and what you will do. A, assume the design documents are not done yet. B, assume the design documents have been issued for bidding and are certified, signed by the architect. And they're out for construction. All right? Five minutes, we'll reconvene. All right, I'm coming back to this side of the room with the mic.
Okay, let's uh, take 30 seconds and wrap up. All right, let's... Uh, I need the uh, mic back on this side. We're, we're going to the back of the room on this side. Sorry, guys. Right over here. He doesn't speak. Nobody, nobody wants to take the mic. All right. Now, there's no, there's no, there's no right or wrong first answer here, but and I'll tell you why in a minute. But for me, there's the number one thing I want to know. Does anybody want to take a stab? You guys first. What's the number one thing you guys want to know here? I, 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 think, I think the first thing that I would want uh, would be a release letter from the architect who's being dismissed. Okay. That's, that's an important thing to get. A couple other people over here said, why? Now, when I was a young whippersnapper lawyer, I'd get the call that would say, I'm firing my lawyer, I want to hire you. And I'd think, well, that's fantastic, because obviously I'm a much better lawyer than that other joker, and this is great, you're making the right decision. Now, after getting some gray hair because of people like that, the first thing I want to know is why. Because somebody who's firing their professional and wants to hire somebody else, there's usually a story there. And I might even want to talk to the person getting fired uh, so they know what's going on, and I get the story about what's really going on. This may be a project that you don't want to step into, and there may be some very good reasons you don't want to step into it. So that's the first thing. Now, the next thing you mentioned was a, a release letter. Um, uh, not to press you too hard, but why release for what? Well, I, I think what I would want to make sure is that even though that architect's being dismissed, that he has been paid for the services that he performed up to that point. You don't want to be taking over a project and having that, that first architect coming back and say, well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm the design professional. I own that design. And um, he could, you could end up being sued. Ah, you, you just hit on, on the next really important point. Who owns the document? The first architect. The well, design. how do you know that? It's, I believe that's just written statement in Minnesota law, isn't it? Nope. No. 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 It. You, 
you got you got to here 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 you got to read the contract. You have to see the contract between the owner and the architect. And there's always this big battle over who's going to own the documents and it gets into copyright law. Now, each of you sitting in this room when your documents are fixed in a tangible medium of expression, you own the copyright. You can only give it away. Okay? You can give it away as a work made for hire, or you can give it away in an agreement where the owner says, I'm going to own your documents. Now, many owners, like University of Minnesota or State of Minnesota or big corporate developer clients or big nasty clients, are going to say, uh, if you work for me, I'm going to own the documents. And you may have to agree to that. But then you want to make sure that you agree that that doesn't mean your standard specs. It doesn't mean your standard details. It doesn't mean your other work product. It just means that the documents on that project, the owner owns. But then, just for use on that project, not for use on another project, and they hold harmless, indemnify, and defend you for any claims that arise out of the reuse of those documents for anything other than that project. Now, that's getting into another seminar, but ownership of documents is really important. Now, let's assume that the documents are not complete yet, and you decide you're going to take this project over. What are you going to have to talk to the owner about so that you can certify them? You want to take a shot at that or pass? <laughs> pass. You have to come to an agreement as to the work effort needed to complete the document. So the owner might be saying that you're getting a 90% set of documents, but upon review, it might only be 60% for your work effort in order well, for... Well, not only that, but remember what it says when you put, ultimately put your stamp on those documents, right? It says they were done by you or under your direct supervision. Well, here, obviously, a good portion of that work was not done by you or under your direct supervision. You're going to have to say, look, I am going to have to go through and rework and reanalyze and maybe recalculate and recheck all of this work to make sure that I'm comfortable putting my stamp and saying, this is my work. And that's going to be a significant cost to the owner. It might be prohibitive enough that they might second guess whether they really want to fire their architect or not. Now, what if the documents are already out to bid and they're going to start constructing? And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to answer my own question. <laughs> my advice is freeze those documents in time. Let them be used. Any supplements or revisions or edits you do as a separate document certified by yourself, but you clarify, you know, this is just supplementing the set that was approved. Now, the real problem comes when the uh, architect that got fired writes the letter to the building code and says, I'm withdrawing my certification. Now, some building code officials won't let that happen. Some will let that happen. Some will say, what do I do now? Uh, and it creates, can create a bit of a gray area. Uh, but that, that, that could happen. It shouldn't happen, but it could. All right, the last one. We're going to take a few minutes. Actually, because we're running out of time, we'll just dive right into this one and talk about it together. Uh, you've been asked to serve as an expert by your long-standing client, City of Metropolis. A through-wall flashing has failed, resulting in water intrusion. The city attorney who's hiring you makes it clear they want your opinion that the architect, who's a competitor of yours, failed to meet the standard of care. And the design documents have a clear error in the flashing detail, but you observe the conditions and notice that the contractor didn't build it per that detail. Will you take the job and what you report to the client? How many of you act as uh, expert witnesses occasionally? Uh, maybe 5 10, 5% or so, 10% small group. Um, the, uh, uh, first of all, of course, we hire experts all the time. And, and I will not tell an expert what they're supposed to find. I'll tell an expert, here's the problem we're having. Here's what we think the problem is. But I want you to analyze the problem and figure out what's going on and tell me. I may ask you to draft a report and let me look at it before it's finally published, or I may ask you not to write a report at all, or I may have you as a consulting expert that I never disclosed to anybody as opposed to a testifying expert that comes in later. So there's a lot of those issues that come into play here. But you should be very cautious of, of any client who dictates to you what they want you to do that's within your sphere of professional practice. Now. The other point that I raise with this issue is 
How many have been, I've never been to an audience where somebody didn't raise their hand. How many have been to the press bar in, uh, in St. Cloud, Minnesota? Yes. Every audience I've been, somebody's been to the press bar in St. Cloud. The press bar in St. Cloud, Minnesota is a famous case. Uh, it was remodeled. The front of the building was remodeled a number of years ago. And during that remodel process, the front building, the front of the building collapsed and injured a couple of workers. Architect, uh, was hired, quoted a fee for the project, and the owner said, well, that's way too much. Just give me a set of plans and then stay away. So he gave him a set of plans. It was supposed to be through bolting through the walls in the front. They don't, the contractor only used lag bolts because the lag bolts, the front of the building fell off, injured the workers. And, um, they sued the architect and the architects, hey, my plans were fine. Had through all the, yeah, but you had a duty to at least make sure that what was designed was being done. You had some general duty to, to observe the work. They took that up to the Court of Appeals and the court said, no, 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 no. No, you, first of all, the architect's duty is only as it's defined in the contract. And if you don't opt for construction administration or site observation, there's no general duty to supervise. And oh, by the way, if the architect's plans weren't followed, then they can't be the proximate cause of the defect. And why do I say it that way? Because for a negligence action, you have to have a duty, uh, a breach of that duty, and that has to be the proximate or direct cause of damages. So architects, no general duty to supervise, and if the plans aren't followed, then the architect can't be negligent, thanks to Press Bar in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, so that pretty much concludes my program. We don't have a lot of time for questions. Says, I'll be here for a few minutes after the program. One hand up here. What? I have a question regarding plan standing. Um, because I observe that the multi-degree plan actually is critical that has no idea what the plan project they have very little to do with. I got it. And uh, by the letter of your of this uh, professional conduct, uh, what it should be reporting is ridiculous. And then, and, and conversely, uh, a lot of times the principal is doing it to protect their employees from being directly liable for the work. The, the, the question is uh, plan stamping, and within an office, situations where maybe the principal stamps the drawings because that's the office policy or they're trying to protect the others from liability, uh, and should that be reported, and how long are you going to be able to keep your job if you start reporting your boss and the owner of the firm for ethical violations. Um, technically, it is a violation because the person certifying the documents isn't going to be able to say they were done my, by me or under my direct supervision. Now, maybe they're stretching the direct supervision into these people work for me and um, you know, I, I, that's therefore I'm supervising it. You need to go back to those definitions and say, look, here are the actual definitions, and you need to be aware of that and handle that as delicately as you can. I mean, I'm obviously I'm aware of the fact that what you're saying is you're an employee and you got senior guys stamping the drawings, and you're not going to keep your job very long if you start reporting on them. But I think they need to understand the definition of responsible charge and direct supervision. All right, I'll be here to answer questions informally. Thank you very much. This concludes the formal program. Thank you to those in cyberspace.